חנון ורחום אין צדיק. וזרק בחושך כל הישרים, חנון ורחום וצדיק. חנון ורחום אין צדיק. חנון ורחום אדוני, חנון ורחום אדוני, חנון ורחום אדוני. בסדר עצר נפלאותיו, חנון ורחום אדוני, חנון ורחום אדוני, חנון ורחום אדוני. בסדר עצר נפלאותיו, חנון ורחום אדוני. Welcome everyone, we'll be starting momentarily. Good afternoon. My name is Maya Aaron. I am a commercial litigator and partner at Mark Migdal and Hayden in Miami, and I am proud to be the volunteer president of the Miami-Dade Regional Board of Directors for Jewish National Fund USA. Today, we have an exciting program we know you will enjoy. Today's main program is here on Zoom, and once the interviews are over, we will prompt everyone to enter the spatial chat link you all received via email. We will be posting it again in the Zoom chat when we are ready to launch the breakout sessions. For, you, for those of you not familiar with Jewish National Fund USA, we are a non-denominational, apolitical, 501c3 nonprofit organization fundraising to continue the development of the state of Israel across seven action areas, which we will hear about momentarily. Our donor partners and volunteer board members include people from all backgrounds and faiths. 
Our mission is to secure and strengthen the state of Israel by developing the southern communities of the Negev and the northern communities of the Galilee, provide pro-Israel education and advocacy, and travel opportunities to Israel for Americans. Without further ado, let's take a high-level look at the work we do before we begin today's discussions. It all begins with a vision, a vision of lush and breathtaking forests where once was only rocky and brown land, a vision of transforming the Negev and the Galilee, injecting a vitality that is transforming them into places people want to live. A vision for us to speak our values, leaving no one behind. A vision of quenching the thirst of Israel's population and allowing the agricultural economy to thrive. A vision that searches for solutions that will make a better tomorrow. A vision of a continuum, ensuring that we are raising tomorrow's leaders today. A vision that understands that a nation must know its past to create a stronger future. Be a part of our vision. Join us. It is my pleasure now to introduce today's event co-chairs and members of our Miami-Dade Board of Directors. Adam Yormack, owner of Yormack Law and Alligator Title and Escrow, who is our JNF USA Real Estate and Lawyers for Israel Chair and Mitch Feldman, owner of the Feldman Companies, co-chair of our real estate division in South Florida. Guys, take it away. All right, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Maya, and thanks for being here today. Today's program is hosted by our South Florida real estate division. We launched this new philanthropic society for real estate, architecture, construction, developers, everyone in the real estate field is welcome. It's a professionals organization and we're, we're happy to have it up and running and we're very excited about our progress. The group started in our New York region where JNF USA is based back in 2018. Nationally, we now have close to 200 new members and we've been doing some great virtual programs and look forward to going back to in-person in the fall. We think spatial chat um, later in the, uh, we're going to be uh, entering the spatial chat later in the program and will provide uh, a great networking, a better networking experience than Zoom. It's an avatar style program where everyone can uh, communicate with one another and separately. And it's, it's a really um, amazing uh, new piece of technology we're excited to use. So stick around after the interviews with the mayor so that we can get together and enjoy each other's uh, company and chat there. If you're in the industry, I'd like you to consider joining our society today for a minimum of $1,800 a year. This is a tax deductible expense for your business and we have a national referral directory and a great lineup of programs coming up this summer. If you're interested to learn more about us in the sp about all of this in the spatial chat room later, uh, please do so or reach out to any one of us on the board. Um, for everyone else here today, please consider making a contribution into an, to an amount that's meaningful to you. And this supports all the work that we do here in Israel. Um, and we're a four, four out of four star charity on Charity Navigator, which is a group that does um, rankings for different charities based on how much money they take in and how much money actually goes to uh, the programs that they sponsor. So you can feel really great about uh, every dollar that you spend with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adam. It's great, uh, great to be here with you and uh, join in this great program. Before we kick off the program with an interview with our very own Mayor Francis Suarez, Mayor of Miami, everyone knows Miami is open, and Mayor Tal Ohana of Yerucham, and that's Miami's sister city in Israel. A quick thank you to today's sponsors. Um, one, we'd like to uh, thank the Glickfield Family Foundation and Greenberg Traurig. We thank you very much for your ongoing support to our campaign. Thank you, Ben Rogatinsky of ECFO AI, Scalable Remote Financial Departments powered by technology. ECFO AI provides businesses with an entire financial and accounting structure from staff to the CFO position. Their outs outsourced structure allows you to access resources that fit your needs, your schedule, and the size of your business. We'd also like to thank you 
Mara Mattis of Cor Cornerstone Group for your ongoing generous support of Israel as a major donor of JNF USA. Mara is active with our real estate division, Woman for Israel, and as an angel investor, has, a, has joined our upcoming South Florida Israel TIE TIE Council. More on that we'll talk about later. And I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Lenny Wolf and George Lopez from Cornerstone. They're here joining us today as well. We'd also finally like to thank you to today's supporting sponsors, Alex Heckler, Jacqueline Arbo Arbolita, and the team at LSN Partners, and Sandy Simoli of SNB Interiors. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, enjoy these great interviews with our very own Mayor Francis Suarez and Mayor Tal Ohana, conducted by our Real Estate Division Co-Chairman, Adam Lipkin, known around Miami and all of social media as the C-Pace guy. All right, welcome everyone. This is Adam Lipkin. I'm really, really excited to be with you all today. I have a very special guest that we're gonna announce in just a second, but uh, just a little background. I'm a volunteer with the uh, Jewish National Fund USA. I'm a lay leader and I'm part of the South Florida Committee with the Real Estate Society and the founding member of the new Thai Council, which stands for Technology, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And it's a new networking group that we're just launching in South Florida. It's to bridge and create a coalition, people to people coalition between the South Florida community, that's everything happening in the tech scene and the, the global hub that Israel is. And so we're really excited to be able to now announce it on this session right here with all of you. And uh, the membership's gonna include VC, venture capital, private equity, angel investors, founders, uh, innovators, everybody that's helping to really launch this tech scene. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about it, definitely reach out to us afterwards. We're going to get you on our list and we're going to make sure to give you updates on the upcoming events, including our kickoff that's coming soon. So with no further ado, I have a very special guest with us today. We're here with none other than the mayor of Miami, Mr. Francis Suarez, probably the most popular mayor in the country, if not the world today. Uh, really, really excited. For those of you not in the 305, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of the mayor. I'm going to leave it for him to find a little bit of the, the dots. But the mayor is a born and raised Miamian. He is the first Miami-born mayor. He's uh, been elected in since 2017, an overwhelming majority vote, over 86% of the vote. I mean, absolutely incredible. Some would say that he was... Um, you know, it was in his blood. Uh, his, uh, his father is the former mayor of Miami in the 80s and 90s. So he really grew up uh, in this culture. And it's really exciting to be with the mayor today. Uh, there's a, a tweet heard around the world uh, that a lot of you might have heard, uh, the uh, how can I help tweet. And you've just seen the mayor uh, just really taking things to the next level in Miami. Personally, being down here myself, born and raised South Floridian, it's so incredible to be part of this. And so really, really happy to have the mayor with us here today. Mayor Suarez, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Adam. It's really a, a pleasure and honor to be with you. And I think I should, we should go on the road with this. I mean, this, that intro was like top notch, man. I mean, I can, I, can, I can take you around with me and you can intro me everywhere I go. My pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs> so Mayor, we're just gonna start out. We're just gonna jump into it because I know your time is short. So Mayor, there's so many parallels between Israel and Miami. Both are relatively young in the world stage compared to other nations and cities. Both are melting pots of ethnicities and nationalities. Miami really is truly the gateway to the Americas. I mean, you see somebody from everywhere in the world. And Israel is home to over 80 ethnic groups. Really incredible. Both have world-class tourism. And in this special moment in time, both are really beacons of individual freedom. They're business-friendly support and magnets of innovation and technology, and especially during this response to the coronavirus pandemic. Miami now has really come on the tech scene in a whole nother way. The groundwork has been laid over the last couple of decades. I feel like you really came in here really at the pit of the recession, uh, you know, as a commissioner, and then you really saw it back up and we're now at this peak and there's a lot of excitement and we're coming off of this year of being in COVID and you really have shined. So what, what I want to start out with is I want to talk a little bit about, there's a lot of eyes on you. There's a lot of business leaders paying attention to what you're doing. There's a lot of civic leaders. So I want to first ask you a little bit about the origin story, the mayor, and some of what shaped your philosophy and how you're governing today that might be able to share with the group. So thank you. I'd love to hear that. Thanks, Adam. And, and I think, you know, when you talk about the similarity between Miami and, and, and Israel, and particularly Tel Aviv, which is 
right uh, in the virtual background that you have, which actually shows the metamorphosis of Tel Aviv's beach and Miami Beach, yeah, which I think is a really, really cool background and a really cool graphic. And I think it, it shows how similar we are, but I think culturally we're very, very similar. Miami is a very Hispanic culture, very entrepreneurial culture, um, one that uh, understands uh, family and understands how to take risks and the premium on education. So that's what we are, who we are as a people. I think what we are as a government in terms of philosophy is, is the following. One is we believe, and a lot of cities, unfortunately, in America do not believe this, that we should not be taxing you any more than what you need to be taxed. Uh, we think that uh, we, I've, under my watch, we've lowered taxes to the second lowest millage rate since like the 1960s. Um, so we just believe that, you know, we have a billion dollar government. It's plenty of resources for us to do our job and, and to do the things that we need to do. So the first thing is not to tax you any more than you need to be taxed. You're already paying a lot of taxes. We have no state income tax. We have no, no, um, no local income tax as, as in other cities. So that's one of our governing philosophies. The second one, this is important, not just for Israel, and, and Israel knows this in terms of its foreign threats. And, and, but there's so many countries in South America that see this domestically, which is we have put a premium on safety. The, uh, from that billion dollars that we invest, we have the largest police force that we've ever had in our history. When cities across America were talking about defunding police, we talked about increasing police funding. So I think that's, uh, you know, that, that was something that has distinguished us from a lot of other cities. We, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have reduced crime by 25% last year. We had the lowest homicide rate since 1954, the year before. So we put a premium on, 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 on making sure that people can be successful, uh, making sure that, uh, that they can be safe. And then I think the third thing is we believe in entrepreneurship. We believe that uh, innovation is gonna pave the way for the future. I'm a father of two, I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. I was a first generation born with a personal computer and, uh, and, and with phones that are more powerful than, uh, you know, than, than, the, than the first uh, manned air, you know, spacecraft. And, and I think for us, it, it became very apparent to me when I first was elected you know, 11 years ago, that if a city wants to thrive, the city wants to succeed, it has to be in the forefront of the knowledge-based economy. You know, those beautiful beaches behind you, that's not enough. You know what I mean? Yes, that will bring uh, tourism to our community, but it's, it's not enough. And so if, if we don't uh, work hard to make sure that our economy works for everyone, we're gonna get behind. And that would be a disservice to all the residents of our community. And frankly, we're, we're a beacon of hope for the world and for the United States. So we, we hope that our formula is something that is replicated city after city. We're hoping that that's what happens. Let me, uh, let me ask you a little bit, follow up on that. So I've heard you say on a couple of occasions, tech is infused with everything. Every sector is getting touched by technology. It's not just like a bucket item in one specific sector. How do you fulfill on that? How do you make it so that tech is part of the DNA and part of the overall context in which you actually connect with private businesses and do business in general? I'm curious how you approach that. Well, I think, I think you first have to realize uh, the, the impact of tech, right? Tech literally, like you said, it's a sub-industry of every industry. So I think, you know, there are some things that we want to differentiate ourselves on. Uh, we've, I focus a lot on, for example, cryptocurrency, yep. because I think that that's something that uh, we, can, we can easily um, um, differentiate ourselves on. One of the other ones that I'm looking at now is e-gaming. I really think that, you know, the city of Miami can be an e-gaming hub. Oh, it's but, a tremendous industry, yep. Yeah, it's an, and it's a growing industry. I mean, when, when a lot of sports have stagnated for a lot of reasons, e-gaming is just, the growth on it is, is off the charts. Oh, so it's unbelievable. They have leagues. I mean, it's a whole industry. It's wild. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Wild. Yeah. Not only do you have people playing the games, you have people watching the people playing the games, which is, oh, yeah. it's mind-boggling. You know, when I was it's a kid, unbelievable. it was one thing that, you know, whether the question was whether you played sports or whether you, whether you, you know, whether you would be inside a game. Now to think of somebody actually watching somebody game, like it's just, it's mind-blowing. It's different than the Nintendo days for us, you know? It's like a whole nother Absolutely. level, right? So, Absolutely. all right, so let's talk about, we're, we're now going on over a year in this pandemic with COVID. And I feel like you really got on the map in a big way early on. I think you were like the second case. Yep. You, you did a really interesting thing where you documented your experience. And yep. I think at a time where there was that real, I mean, there's still obviously a fear, but there was a real fear early on. I don't think people really got what happened and what was going on. And you documented your journey. And I, I want to just ask you a little bit about What's been your mindset since the start and now over this year? Because you really leaned in. You've really shown up as a leader. And I feel like there's been a balance of safety and also allowing people to thrive. And it's tough to find that balance. Some, some you know, local leaders are 
airy maybe a little too much on the side of safety at the expense of commerce. So how have you approached this uniquely and how's that really philosophy showing up in how you're leading in the local community? Well, first of all, I think it is an incredibly difficult balance. I think that there is this misperception that, and, and first of all, it's become politicized and that, that is horrible. When you have a Absolutely. pandemic where, where people are making decisions based on political philosophy or ideology, it's crazy. Um, but I think part of it is this uh, sort of concept that, you know, that, that, um, that uh, you know, in my case, I, I was the first one that got it. So I, I was, I was, it was, it was much more, uh, it was easier for me to be able to, uh, you know, figure out exactly how to deal with it on a personal level and share that experience with the public. I think, you know, the idea of having a, you know, the idea of having a, a, a diary was someone close to me suggested and it was interesting. I mean, if, if I would get up in the morning and I wouldn't diary by a certain time of the day and I wouldn't publish a diary, I had people calling me like crazy. Hey, man, are you OK? So but I think it, it, it gave people a lot of peace and comfort. So that was part of it. I think the second part of it was I didn't take a political approach. So that was number two. And the third part of it is, is I listened to experts. And like you said, I leaned into the leadership opportunity when when, you know, when something bad happens. You know, it's 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 a it's not a positive thing, but it's it is an, a leadership opportunity, right? Leaders don't only lead when times are good. Leaders also lead when times are not good. And sometimes the most important leadership is done when when times are not good. So I Absolutely. think for me, I felt uh, it was important for me to consult my experts, but also to apply a measure of common sense and understand that again, there's this false equivalency where you're either trying to protect human life or trying to protect the economy, right? It you know number one, number two. COVID creates misery on both ends. And again, I think that's another false equivalency where, where, where it, you know, made it seem like if you, if you want to protect people's jobs and you want to protect their livelihoods, that must mean you don't care about their lives. Yep. And that's not true. You know what I mean? That's not true at all. Um, when, you know, it's a very difficult decision to decide, hey, I need to shut down on an entire part of an economy because I want to save lives. It's, it's, it's important to save lives. A lot of people have passed. Half a million people have died or more and half a million people at this point. But, but there's also millions and millions of people who have lost their jobs, you know, who have not been able to provide for their families. So there's human tragedy and human suffering on both sides of this issue. And I've just tried to be apolitical, listen to the experts and use common sense. Yeah, you've done a tremendous job with it. It's really been incredible to see. And uh, I think we're thriving as a result. All right, let's, let's just shift a little bit to, you know, that's an environmental risk through airborne virus. Let's talk about other environmental risks that cities face. I mean, we're, we're here in Miami, and the most obvious environmental risk is the water, hurricanes, climate change. That's a big item that you talk about. Let's hear a little bit more about initiatives that you've taken on to be able to combat our big issues, which is water, sea level rise, and uh, hurricanes. You know, what are you doing to be able to set up Miami for success to be more resilient and more sustainable? Well, when you talk about what kind of a way can Miami differentiate itself in terms of technology, that's one of the ways. Um, you know, I've been blessed with having, uh, number one, leadership opportunities in this space. I was the chair of the Environment Committee for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Yep. And then uh, I now sit on, uh, on uh, a global adaptation uh, council that used to be a committee that uh, made a, a presentation of its findings to the United Nations. And so that was a committee that was started by the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon after he left uh, the, the Secretary General position. So for me... Uh, one, I've had a, a, a voice and I've been able to talk about this issue on the national and international stage. Number two, as residents of the city of Miami, they've invested in my leadership and they've invested in our government's ability to solve this problem. They've given us $200 million of resources to be able to solve the problems of, 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 of water resiliency. And now I'm not saying that $200 million is going to solve it all, but it's $200 million more than most cities have, number one. Number two, most people don't know that cities like Miami are already significantly harder to, to hurricanes and sea level rise, right? We, we have actually suffered less amount of money in, in hurricane damage uh, than New York has. So for me, um, it's incredibly, um, you know, it's incredibly, uh, uh, you know, it's an incredible issue that we have the ability now to confront this uh, in, in a meaningful way. And then we're hopeful that, you know, I, I spoke to the president elect at the time, now President Biden, and he point blank told me, look, uh, mayor, we're going to look to you for solutions. And, and for me, what I'm gonna, one of the things I'm going to propose is if you're a, a local government that has put skin in the game 
the federal government should match your contribution, at least dollar for dollar. So, so we can leverage that 200 million and make it 400 million and get twice the number of resiliency projects, whether it's sea, uh, sea level uh, wall increases in height, whether it's uh, urban reservoirs, whether it's uh, pump stations um, and a variety of, of techniques. We, we hope we could get you over to Israel and do what the uh, governor did on his trade mission to bring back some of the Israeli tech to solve some of our problems. So that I would be love great. to. I would love that. Yeah, that was a great mission, very successful. That's uh, helping out with some of the uh, challenges in Lake Okeechobee. Uh, really, really cool. Uh, all right, so let's just kind of pivot a little bit too. Here we are. We're just at the beginning of this decade. It's really interesting that we've just come off of this year, but the future looks so bright for Miami. Share a little bit for us. What do you see as the vision for Miami in 2030? Fast forward, we're we're having this conversation at 2030. And what's happening? Well, what's I'm, I'm going to tell you something, and it's going to sound fantastical. Do right? it. I think Miami has the ability by 2030 to be the most important city or one of the most important cities in the world. And I think the reason why is because we have a, a, a mass migration now <clears throat> from cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Silicon Valley, and New York. <clears throat> and you have <clears throat> two mega markets of capital that are reuniting in a particular place. And that's never happened in the history of humanity. Now, obviously, we have to compete uh, with major cities like Tel Aviv um, and, other, and other global cities. But I think we have an opportunity to be right there at the top. And, and, and frankly, can overtake even cities like New York, LA, and San Francisco. Because again, that productive capital is going to go to places like Israel and like, uh, like, like Tel Aviv and like Miami, where entrepreneurship is, is cultivated. It's embraced. It, it wants to grow. And it can grow. And I think that's a, that Miami is well positioned for that. That's awesome. I think that you really are doing a phenomenal job leading this moment. You call it a movement. I think it's just only getting more exciting. We're so excited to be able to create more of a bridge with what's going on in Israel, what's going on in Miami. So I really want to thank you for your time right now today and really just showing up as a leader on the global stage and uh, really having uh, the right mindset, uh, really uh, having an inclusive politics, which is, uh, which is very welcome these days. I mean, it's, uh, you're the only mayor that I follow on Twitter, I'll tell you that. So uh, well, it's very great to be able to have somebody leading through possibility and opportunity and uh, not through some of the divisiveness. So uh, really just cheers to you. Thank you so much for that. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I want to end this conversation with is a recognition of the, the unique relationship that the United States and Israel have and the strategic significance of Miami and Israel and others and, 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 and Tel Aviv and other Israeli cities, uh, our sister cities in, in Israel, uh, also uh, strengthening that bond. Uh, we now have direct flights uh, to Israel, and that's incredibly important for, for Miami. And I think it's going to continue this, this collaborative effort that we're seeing uh, by two cities and countries that are so similar in their values and in their objectives and our, our democracies that are important to the sustainability and viability of the, of the world, frankly. So for me, it's, uh, it's just very exciting. Awesome. Well, I know you had a, a first trip there a few years ago and is really moving. And uh, we look forward to being able to uh, help uh, shape that itinerary for the second one when, uh, when we're a little bit post-COVID. So thanks again, Mayor, so much for your time today. And I uh, look forward to being able to uh, help you out with uh, some more of these great initiatives. So I'm so excited. We have a, a very special guest with us. I'm very pleased to introduce the mayor of Miami's sister city in Israel, Yerucham, uh, Mayor Tal Ohana. Uh, just such an incredible leader. The mayor uh, was born and raised in Yerucham, and she was the first uh, uh, woman elected mayor in 2018. Such an incredible backstory, uh, fourth generation of immigrants from Morocco. This is just in her blood. Uh, she has such a deep why, and it's just amazing to see all the incredible work she's done in Yerucham. Uh, she's really been at the forefront battling the pandemic, succeeded in curbing the infection rate by personally seeking uh, and making sure that her residents' needs are taken care of, uh, really stepping up at that local leadership level as we've seen uh, some others do. And uh, many other leaders in Israel paid attention and, and with much success to be able to curb the, uh, the spread of the pandemic in their towns as well. Uh, she's an active community leader, having uh, men or general positions in the Rashi Foundation, the Isa Foundation, and the Yerucham Community Center. Served as a director of the Young People's Association in Yerucham, which focuses on at-risk youth leadership and settlement. And she stewarded education and strategic development in the city, serves as a member of the planning and building committee. Mayor Ohana has enlisted partners from Israel and around the world to make a significant impact in healthcare, welfare, education, and employment. And with that, Mayor, uh, so happy to be with you today. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be with you today. Awesome. Well, let's just start a little bit with the background. I, I love the story, uh, born and raised, and must be such a 
a life dream to now be the city uh, mayor in the town that you grew up in. Tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up, uh, you know, a, a little while back, uh, you know, and, and now kind of seeing the, the city really grow and then and being just a leader to now take it to the next level. Tell us a little bit about growing up in Yerucham. It's a, you know, southern, southern uh, town in Israel, in the Negev. Uh, you know, what, what was that like? You know, it's it's a huge honor for me. It's it's a meaningful life. Uh, it's a meaningful yeah. story. I think all my passion is coming from this uh, from the roots. Uh, I'm sharing uh, in this town the fact that I'm the first generation to be born to be born in Israel, uh, but the fourth generation here because my great grandmothers are, are, are came came uh, at the sixties also to Yerucham. Uh, when I'm thinking about my vision, what I'm doing every day from morning to night, uh, I'm thinking first and foremost about the first generation, about the, the pioneers. You know, we are celebrating 70 years of yeah. this development town. And I'm telling every time, nothing would happen if, without them. Uh, the fact that they faced those challenges at the early beginning of the state of, of this town, uh, taking very good decision about their the children's future, about education, working every work. They have not many options those years. And uh, the fact that we got better education, it's because of them. And now we can choose, we can lead the town for technology future. I'm very connected to, to the roots and, uh, and I'm trying to do my best to design the future and the present of this town. Uh, I, I start my journey when I was 26 in politics. You know, I was very young, the, the only woman in the in the city council. Uh, and, and for the past two and, and six months, two years and six months, I'm the mayor. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, I'm trying to do my best, you know, and, yeah. and it, I need to prove that I'm worthy to this big challenge. Uh, but I have the best team. Uh, and I um, really, really want to succeed. I want, to, I want to do everything I can uh, to to make sure that we have economic uh, development, to have social mobility, to have life quality, uh, and we we want to double our staff. We want to be 20,000 20, citizens in, in in seven eight years. So we need to be very attractive. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk a little bit about what you have planned over the next decade. But I'll tell you one word that I, I think of a lot when it comes to you and some of what I read about is just resilient. And I think resiliency really just comes with being somebody that could step up in adversity and challenge. And, and certainly when I think of Israel in general, that's the embodiment of Israel. And I think when it comes to some of, um, you know, some, some of your uh, generation, right, you know, some of the other folks that came over, I think that's such a why so powerful to have, you know, such a such a great why behind that and at the foundation. Tell me a little bit. We had to deal with a, a real challenging year. You know, we're, we're all still in the pandemic. You know, we're seeing now a light at the end of the tunnel. But I think one of the things where you really stepped up on that I saw was uh, how do you handle as a local leader uh, the pandemic? Uh, you know, and, and what were things that you found that you were doing locally that really had things move in the right direction? And maybe also where you found others maybe not doing. What were lessons learned from your experience? You know, I, I start this very challenging year when I understood this is my responsibility. You know, I'm not sharing my responsibility with others. I said I have 100% responsibility about my citizens' health and and in this case i need to do everything i can to make sure that i'm cutting you know that the change uh, that i do uh, i i am taking decision not because someone asked me to take them but because i think this is the right thing to do uh, i think that it's all about resilience uh, all, the, all about faith all about hope this is the three issue of this one uh, past year of pandemic uh, when I'm trying to to make uh, agreement with my Haredic ultra orthodox community, uh, you know, I am trying to convince them not to open the schools or or to to, to be disciplined. Uh, I have very good partnership with them because they trust me. They know that I will do everything I can for their health. 
and for their special needs. Uh, and I was very proud all over this year to see that we have different communities from different identities, but all of them feel that we are united, uh, that, that we are together in this, in this challenge. And um, it's all about hope because I needed to fight for the workplace to, to keep working and I need to convince them uh, to, to go to make the vaccine. Uh, the, the, it was not, you know, very, very easy for all of them. But I told them we want to have uh, our life back. Uh, and we tried all this year to do everything, like, everything we can to make sure that life continues. We have culture in the neighborhood and not in the, only in the community center. And we have education in the neighborhood and not only in the school. But we want our community life back. And that's why we need uh, to be uh, really uh, care each other and, and make the vaccine. And, and you, you spoke about resilience. This is the main issue. You know, most of the people that they were, that they were sick, nothing happened to them. But the fact that they lose their jobs or uh, was afraid about their children, uh, this is, I understood from the very beginning that I need to empower them and to yeah. give them the, the, the feeling that I'm here for them each and every hour in, 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 in Shabbat, in the holidays, although I am a religious woman, I'm here for them uh, for anything they need and everything will be okay. So yes, the issue of resilience was very um, meaningful in this uh, in this journey. Yeah, and and I think also what you just shared in that, which I think is so powerful, is having a shared future that empowers you. Uh, I think sometimes you get too caught up in just the immediacy of the problem. It sounds like you were really connecting with everybody, a diverse population, of a shared future of wanting to be able to get back to enjoy life. Uh, really, is what it came down to. So. Uh, congratulations. I know we're still in it, but it seems like we really made a lot of headway and uh, uh, God willing, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be through this uh, soon enough. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what you shared before. Uh, Yerucham got started in 1951, very diverse population and first wave of immigrants uh, like your family from North Africa, um, Iran, India, Russia, you know, with such a diverse population, 10,000 people, you want to double it over the next several years. I find that oftentimes there is these hidden silver linings in some challenges. So some might say, oh, that's a real challenge. You got a lot of populations coming, different interests. Where have you find opportunity in, uh, in the geography maybe, in the people with the diversity, where others might say, wow, what a challenge, where you say, what an opportunity. Tell us a little bit about where you see the biggest opportunity in your, you know, in your specific area when with your people. You know, we are dealing um, most of our time with social mobility. And I had a very special life experience when I went to the army. And for the first time, I met different population. You know, I, I, I grew up in a very small town. We are now 12,000, but, but used to be eight or 7,000. Uh, and when I went to the army, I said, I cannot deal with those with those people, they are much better than me. Uh, and, 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 that, and, and this time, that time, I promised myself that I'm coming back to my town and, I'm, and, and I will do everything I can to connect with, between different communities. And nowadays, Yerucham is so diverse that I can do that in the schools, in the non-formal education system. Uh, and, and I proved to the government that uh, the best way to create social mobility is to create intercultural meetings between between children from from different communities and now we are develop a, a, a model for that uh, for that education uh, system how we uh, affect the the parents identity how we create pedagogic uh, that's relevant for this meeting how we uh, attack the emotional and social needs of, of, of each child in this, in, in this diverse meeting. And uh, so yes, for Yerucham, the fact that we are so diverse, it's an opportunity for social mobility. Uh, and, and we can um, prove it in, in you know, with details. And uh, when we uh, ha win, uh, when we uh, got the, 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 the chairman uh, prize in the robotic competition in the state, it was because we are we are diverse because we we take the robotic mission and we create partnership with the Bedouin community 
and with the different children that are coming from the others in, in Yerucham. Uh, so so I'm, I'm very sure and very insistent uh, to create more and more meetings and, and, and platforms for this uh, diverse uh, uh, intercultural situation. I mean, look, I, I love that you brought that up. I mean, that's, that's also what we're trying to foster here. We really want to be able to build that conversation, that diversity in the conversation with, with us over here in the States and Israel, because you have such possibility when you have different perspectives. And I, I totally agree with what you said is that, you know, when you have everybody thinking the same thing, there's only so much that could be possible. But when you start to collaborate and have people with different perspectives and different backgrounds thinking together, magic happens. So it's really amazing to see that you've just capitalized on that, you've embraced it, and you're, you're seeing the results. You're having these incredible accolades and accomplishments. Uh, so in addition to robotics, uh, I've also heard Yerucham is also now starting to be known the, uh, the cannabis capital of Israel. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, at the same time, that came out of a challenge. You know, there were some factories that were leaving. You saw that, you know, there was a land that needed to have something happen on it, right? And so it seemed like you also took another challenge and created an opportunity with it. Tell us a little bit about that backstory, if you can, and now what's happened since and, and how I think internationally you've gotten a lot of attention uh, positioning Yerucham in this, in this fast-growing industry around the world. So I must say that the situation is bad. You know, after many years, we were totally dependent on the traditional industry. We are losing it one after one. Yeah. And, and one day, you know, before 100 days in my position finished, I, I came to my office and I met many journalists waiting for me. They said, okay, the glass factory is about to, to close and the cosmetic one already, what are you going to do? And I said, this is our best opportunity. We want to have quality jobs. And they asked me, okay, what are you going to do now? And I said, give me one week. I will give you a full answer for that. I'm not worried. I'm going to design our new economic field. And I came to my office and I got some phone call from some Russian guy and he asked me if I would give him a permission to, uh, to create a factory for medical cannabis in Yerucham. And I answered, no, drugs is our past story. It will not be our future. And my secretary said, why are you answering that way? Think one hour and give him an answer. And I spent all the night reading the, the economic newspaper and I understood that there is a new market in Israel. It's not happening every day. And then I called him back and said, okay, just come. And I start my journey uh, to develop my vision, how we will become the capital town of Israel for medical cannabis. Nowadays, we have two factories. We have incubator, with 160 million shekels, two companies out of 25 that will be inside the, the incubator. We have agriculture field, we have can academy uh, that recreation, uh, that, uh, that um, give a professional training to thousands of people every year here in this town. And I'm waiting, you know, because I said, we have the pharmaceutical company, American pharmaceutical company, Perigo, inside our town. They gave the money to the incubator. Maybe one day they will decide to produce some, uh, some drugs from, 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 the, from the cannabis. Until then, we have everything we want. We have industry, we have agriculture, we have technology, we have R&D, uh, and also we have academy. So yeah. this is one example how we create ecosystem from just you know one small idea. The same yeah. thing we do with drones, with settles, uh, with uh, um, uh, military industries, with tourism. We understood we understood that we uh, we, we need to act like a, a business in, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and to, to, to bring everyone the, the perspective that we have assets, we have human capital, the best one, engineers and techniques, uh, and, and more than that, we have incentive and we are very passionate to help them and to succeed to creating 1,000 quality jobs in five years. This is the aim. I got to tell you, I mean, the big theme I'm hearing, and, and we just heard about this recently with the mayor in Miami, um, public-private partnerships, some of them are just, they just don't work, and some could be so beautiful, 
And it sounds like, I mean, it's a great example. You had this guy, you know, he approached you about this opportunity. The past conversation was not a fit. Luckily, a colleague said, hey, you know, Mayor, we want to look at this newly. And here's this beautiful opportunity that now came from it. So I just love that. And I think that there, there's so much available. There's so many great ideas that are always coming to mayors and local leaders. And I think being willing to listen to it newly is huge. And it seems like it's now created uh, so much possibility. It's creating the jobs, creating the buzz. So I love that story. And I love how it really took something to see something new that might not have been there initially. So I, I love that. That's, that's such a great backstory. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the JNF and uh, Yerucham partnership. Uh, there were several creek developments that uh, partnered on, including the uh, Yerucham River Park, Yerucham Fire Station, just some that come to mind. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit about these projects and also what it's like to be able to get all the stakeholders aligned towards uh, you know, getting these complete? What works? So yes, we we uh, we are we are so proud to be JNF uh, partners all over the years. You know, I start my my public journey when I was the CEO of Young Adults in Yerucham, and the, the our building, our home built by JNF. It is the first donation JNF uh, made in in Yerucham. and then we just became a best uh, best friends. Uh, and nowadays we are working to develop more and more infra infrastructure for tourism. We have the river park uh, that we just about to start the development of the area. Uh, and we, we are dreaming big. We are dreaming now about small businesses, how we uh, gave them the tools they need for digital and digital marketing. Uh, and not only, I think that we are, we are acting very dynamically uh, to try understand what are the gaps and how we can narrow, narrow that, uh, and it's it's we, we do it like a family. You know, I can call to Russell and say, Russell, we need help in that issue, and then a professional will come and try to to figure out with me what is the best professional solution. Uh, I feel very close to JNF family, and I hope and pray uh, that we will do more and more things in Yerucham because it's. It, you know, it, it takes us to our next generation. It takes us to the future. And uh, we just spoke yesterday about housing uh, and, and water and agriculture. Uh, but the future is for sure with young families, supporting them, creating quality jobs for them. And small businesses is one of the, of the methods. Yeah. Uh, but what, but we, we, we think, you know, 10 years, 20 years ahead. Let's stick with that. So here we are with the beginning of the decade. Uh, you know, we just came off of a, a real challenging year. And I think that after every breakdown, there's a breakthrough in store. So let's just paint the picture. Imagine we're having this conversation and it's 2030. It's the end of the decade. Tell me a little bit about what your home looks like. Maybe like really paint the picture for we're now doubled in size. What are some key initiatives that have been fulfilled on? Let's hear a little bit about what it looks like in the future. We will be 20,000 people for sure. Uh, I think uh, with, with the technology companies uh, from different fields, uh, we will be very uh, unique in our community lives. Uh, and we will see different communities that are settled in Yerucham uh, because it's the best location in Israel between a lack and pressure. And, and, and I, I hope that we will be very unique also with our quality um, statistics. We want to make sure that everyone here getting the best opportunities for social mobility. And I will be very proud that in that time, we will be in a very good uh, shape uh, in, that, in that issue. Uh, as I mentioned, 20,000 20, citizens, new uh, businesses in, in technology with tech, uh, positions uh, and and then we we kept and still we keeping our spirit uh, for for having a, a community life and, and a pioneer story and a meaningful for for making justice uh, and, and to be really responsible each other this is very important for me in our values absolutely well we're going to uh, wrap this up but uh you know we have a, an audience here a lot of folks are maybe hearing from you for the first time and uh, you know, I just want to say, if there's anything else that you'd like to share with the audience, uh, let us know. Uh, we'd love to, uh, you know, make sure that 
uh, you could really be able to say what you want to say. So anything else you want to share with the group? I just want you to know that we feel responsible for you. After many years that the Jews of the diaspora did everything they can to support us, we feel that now we can give back. So just give us the opportunity to tell you, to let you feel that you're important for us. Really, this is your first country in Israel. And be sure that without your Zionism uh, sense, all over the decades, nothing would happen, not in the Negev and not in the Galil. And we really want to thank you for that and, and, and pray for you, for health, for, for prosperity, and stay safe, safe and come to visit as, as, uh, whenever you can. Yeah. This is your home. Beautiful message. Thank you. I, I cannot wait to get back to Israel and uh, hope to be able to see you over there. Um, thanks for your inspiring leadership. Thanks for being a doer. Thanks for somebody that walks the walk. I mean, really incredible to see all the work you're doing. Uh, love the Miami Yerucham connection. It's such a special one and uh, really rooting for you. Really um, uh, want to let you know that you can count on us as well. So thank you again, Mayor, so much.